In September 1989, a hangar door opened in Long Beach, California to reveal what was supposed to be the savior of American aviation. The aircraft that rolled out into the California sun was massive, gleaming, and futuristic. It featured a distinctive third engine mounted on the tail and a polished fuselage that promised to dominate the skies for the next 20 years. This was the McDonnell Douglas MD-11. It wasn't just a new plane, it was a desperate gamble worth billions of dollars. You see, the company that built it was once the undisputed king of the skies, the titan that built the fighters that won the Cold War. But by the late 80s, they were bleeding cash and losing market share. The MD-11 was their answer. It was promised to be the ultimate long-haul machine, an aircraft capable of flying from Singapore to Paris non-stop while burning less fuel than anything else in the sky. It was supposed to stop Airbus dead in its tracks, but the moment the MD-11 entered commercial service, the dream turned into a nightmare. The aircraft didn't just fail to meet its promises, it missed every single critical metric. It was heavy, it was thirsty, and worst of all, it was dangerous. Pilots struggled to land it, airlines hated it, and the company that built it would soon cease to exist. But here is the thing nobody talks about. This isn't just a story about a bad plane. It is the story of how one lazy engineering decision destroyed an American industrial icon and infected Boeing with a culture that haunts it to this day. This is the story of how McDonnell Douglas tried to outsmart physics, but failed miserably. To understand why this disaster happened, we have to go back to the mindset of the 1980s. McDonnell Douglas wasn't just a company, they were aviation royalty. They had built the F-15 Eagle, the fighter jet that dominated global airspace. They had created the DC-8 and the DC-9, the workhorses of the jet age. Their engineers felt untouchable, and their executives believed their brand name alone was enough to sell airplanes. But while McDonnell Douglas was resting on its laurels, a new, scrappy competitor across the Atlantic was hungry. Airbus was spending massive amounts on research and development. They were introducing fly-by-wire technology with the A320 and developing the ultra-long-range A340. They were innovating, while the American giant was stagnating. By the late 1980s, airlines were demanding a new generation of aircraft. They wanted planes that could fly longer distances with more passengers and lower operating costs. McDonnell Douglas faced a critical boardroom dilemma. They needed a product to compete with the upcoming Airbus A340 and the Boeing 747-400. They had two distinct options. Option A was to commit to a clean sheet design, a brand new airplane built from the ground up with the latest aerodynamics and materials. This was the right way, but it was the expensive way, requiring an investment of billions of dollars and years of development. Option B was to take their old, aging DC-10, a design from the 1960s, and give it a massive facelift. They could stretch the fuselage, slap on some winglets, update the cockpit, and call it a new plane. The executives at McDonnell Douglas, driven by short-term profits and a fear of investment, chose option B. They believed they could trick the market. They viewed engineering as a cost to be minimized rather than an investment in the future. They assumed that by modifying a 20-year-old airframe, they could achieve modern performance standards for a fraction of the cost of a new design. But what they didn't appreciate at the time was that you cannot simply paint over old technology and expect it to perform like a 21st century century machine. This decision set the stage for a conflict not with a competitor, but with the laws of aerodynamics. The core requirement for the MD-11 was range. To kill the Airbus competition, this aircraft needed to connect the world's furthest financial hubs. It needed to fly over 7,000 nautical miles with a full payload, but the old DC-10 airframe was heavy and draggy. It was built in an era when fuel was cheap and efficiency was an afterthought. To get that old metal to fly that far, the engineers needed to reduce drag desperately. They looked for every possible shortcut, and they found one at the back of the plane. Every aircraft has a horizontal stabilizer, the little wings on the tail. These stabilizers provide the downward force necessary to keep the nose of the plane level. However, generating this downward force creates drag. A larger tail creates more stability, but also more drag. 
A smaller tail creates less drag but less stability. In a desperate bid to squeeze extra miles out of the design without spending money on a new wing or fuselage, McDonnell Douglas engineers made a radical choice. They slashed the size of the horizontal stabilizer by 30%. They also added a fuel tank inside the tail to shift the center of gravity backward. The theory was simple. By moving the center of gravity aft and shrinking the tail, the plane would require less downward force to fly level. Level. Less downward force meant less drag, and less drag meant more range. They were effectively trying to trick the airframe into being efficient, but they created a monster. By shrinking the tail, they made the aircraft longitudinally unstable. In plain English, the plane didn't want to fly straight. It wanted to pitch up and stall, or pitch down and dive. It was balanced on a knife edge. The engineers knew this was risky, but they calculated that the efficiency gains would be worth it. However, when the first production models rolled off the line, the reality of physics came crashing down. The drag reduction wasn't enough. Even with the dangerous aerodynamic tweaks, the engines had to work harder than expected to push the heavy, modified fuselage through the air. The the plane was missing its range targets by over 500 nautical miles. For an airline, that gap is the difference between a profitable direct flight and a forced fuel stop that destroys the schedule. But the bigger problem was how the plane flew. Because they couldn't afford to redesign the tail or the wing to fix the instability physically, McDonnell Douglas turned to a band-aid solution. They decided to patch the aerodynamic floor with software. They introduced a computer system called the Longitudinal Stability or Augmentation System, or LSAS. Think of it this way. Imagine trying to balance a broom upright on the tip of your finger. It is inherently unstable. Your hand has to constantly make micro-adjustments to keep it from falling. The MD-11 was the broom. The pilot was the finger. But a human pilot isn't fast enough to make those micro-adjustments perfectly for hours on end. So, LSAS was designed to be the digital hand, automatically moving the elevators on the tail to keep the plane level without the pilot even knowing. On paper, it sounded like a brilliant solution. In practice, it was terrifying. The software often reacted in ways that pilots didn't expect. During critical phases of flight, specifically landing, the pilot and the computer would often get into a fight. The pilot would feel the nose dropping and pull back on the stick. The LSA's computer would interpret this as too aggressive and push the nose down. The pilot, feeling the resistance, would pull harder. The plane would begin to bounce in the air. This phenomenon is known as pilot-induced oscillation. The software, designed to fix a hardware problem, ended up disconnecting the pilot from the feel of the aircraft. Pilots reported that the MD-11 was unpredictable, squirrely, and unforgiving. Landing the MD-11 became a high-stakes wrestling match between the human in the cockpit and the code in the computer. While McDonnell Douglas insisted the plane was safe, the accident rate began to creep up. But before the safety reputation truly collapsed, the commercial reputation was already being destroyed. The humiliation began with Singapore Airlines. Singapore Airlines was, and still is, the most prestigious carrier in the world. Their endorsement is the gold standard. In a massive coup, McDonnell Douglas had convinced them to sign a commitment for up to 20 MD-11s, 5 firm orders and 15 options. The airline had explicitly planned to use them on their flagship route from Singapore to Paris. They believed the brochure. They believed the promises of efficiency and range. But before Singapore Airlines even took delivery of a single jet, the truth came out. The performance data from early testing revealed that the plane couldn't make the trip reliably against winter headwinds. The fuel burn was significantly higher than promised. The engines were overworked. The airframe rattled. It was a commercial disaster waiting to happen. Singapore Airlines did the math and realized that operating this fleet would cost them millions in lost revenue and excess fuel. In a move that sent shockwaves through the aviation industry, Singapore Airlines cancelled their entire commitment before a single plane entered their fleet. They didn't just walk away, they publicly dumped the MD-11, and to add salt to the wound, they defected to the competition. They bought the Airbus A340, the very plane the MD-11 was built to destroy. The message to the market was clear, the MD-11 is a lie. The dominoes began to fall. American Airlines, another launch customer, was furious. Their executives discovered that the plane fell 
fell short of its payload guarantees, Delta Airlines faced similar issues. McDonnell Douglas was forced to pay out millions of dollars in performance guarantees and penalties. They scrambled to release performance improvement packages, tweaking the aerodynamics and engines to claw back the missing range. But it was too little, too late. The reputation of the aircraft was shattered. The Hail Mary pass had been intercepted. By the mid-90s, the failure of the MD-11 had drained McDonnell Douglas of its remaining cash reserves. The company stock tanked. Nobody wanted to buy their jets. The commercial division was effectively dead, surviving only on military contracts. The once great titan of American industry was now a carcass waiting to be picked clean. In 1997, the inevitable happened. Boeing swooped in and acquired McDonnell Douglas in a massive deal valued at over $13 billion. On the surface, it looked like a victory for Boeing. They eliminated their domestic rival and absorbed a massive defense portfolio. But this merger contained a poison pill that would eventually bring Boeing to its knees. This is the most critical part of the story. While Boeing bought McDonnell Douglas, the culture of McDonnell Douglas took over Boeing. The old Boeing was run by engineers. It was a company that bet the farm on the 707 and the 747. It was a company that prioritized engineering excellence above all else. McDonnell Douglas, by contrast, was run by bean counters, financial executives who focused on cutting costs, boosting stock prices, and upgrading old platforms rather than innovating. Following the merger, the McDonnell Douglas executives led by Harry Stonecipher ascended to the top ranks of Boeing. They systematically dismantled the engineering first culture. They viewed new aircraft development as too risky and too expensive. Does that sound familiar? It should. This is exactly the philosophy that led to the MD-11, and it is the exact same philosophy that led to the 737 MAX. The parallels are terrifying. Just like with the MD-11, Boeing decided not to build a clean sheet replacement for the 737. Instead, they took a 1960s airframe, bolted on new, heavy engines that disrupted the center of gravity, and tried to fix the aerodynamic instability with software, MCAS. The MKS system on the 737 MAX was the spiritual successor to the LSAS on the MD-11. It was a software patch applied to a hardware problem caused by a refusal to invest in a new design. The failure of the MD-11 was a warning shot that the industry ignored. It proved that you cannot cheat physics with code. It proved that cutting corners on development costs leads to exponentially higher costs in the long run. But because the McDonnell Douglas executives who oversaw the MD-11 failure failed upward into Boeing, the lesson wasn't learned. It was buried. The MD-11 was eventually retired from passenger service much earlier than expected. Most were converted into freighters where their range limitations mattered less and their cargo capacity mattered more. Today, they are a rare sight, mostly flown by cargo carriers like FedEx and UPS. But every time you see one of those three-engine giants roaring into the sky, remember what it represents. It is a monument to corporate hubris. The MD-11 was a technological lie told by a company that forgot what business they were in. They thought they were in the business of managing stock prices. They forgot they were in the business of defying gravity. And in aviation, when you try to outsmart physics to save a dollar, the price is always paid in failure.